Okay. All right. So we, now we have our recording going. So right now we are going to get right into the business of the night. And before we do that, you know, we usually have a take control minute. So our take control minute this evening is actually going to be in the form of a video. So we'll go and get that video for you and um, we'll show that at this time. I trust that you all had a good day and um, you're here ready to learn some information. So our take control minute is a video that's talking about saving a leg and saving a life. The importance. Let me make sure that my audio is going. Can someone give me a thumbs up if you're hearing the audio as well? Can you tell me if you're hearing the video? We're hearing you, but uh, not the video. Okay, hold on one second. Let me pause it and I will start it over because I know I need to hit something. So high. So I'm gonna see 20% of all mini prices on the order online for a limited time. So hurry and take advantage of these low prices. I mean high prices. We came low prices. Hey, we can go swap mini prices on everything for now. For dogs. What if my coverage is right? What if I actually have food truck? What if it gets covered in an anonymous and stay forward there for your work news? Thanks. What did they learn? Stay mom is it? Yeah, I can Lily. Yes. Not seeing or hearing the video. There's a feedback from somebody's mic that's open. So you're not seeing it either? No, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Let me go back to that. We believe. Can you see it now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, and there's a Mel Dawn Clayton. His mic is open and video, and, and there's a feedback coming in. Okay. Thank you. I don't know. Someone know how to tell me how to turn the sound on? I could do that. Well, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Desmond Bell, and I'm the president and founder of. We hear it. We hear it now. We can hear it now. Okay, beautiful. Well, Thank you so much. Pink ribbon. I'm sure you automatically think of breast cancer. Awareness. Please increase the volume. Next month, okay. pink will be seen everywhere, and the messaging to encourage screening and treatment will continue to resonate. The pink ribbon has become synonymous worldwide with this terrible disease. 
and through the efforts of countless individuals, we have seen many lives positively touched and continued improvements in treatment and research. The five-year mortality rate for those suffering with breast cancer continues to decrease and is now estimated between 12 and 14 percent. Yet when I mention PAD Awareness Month, most people, including healthcare providers, do not know that September has been designated as such. The bigger problem, however, is that most people have never heard of PAD or that the only diseases that have worse death rate after five years are lung and pancreatic cancers. In my medical practice, I have witnessed all too often the physical pain and emotional stress mm -hmm. of PAD that afflicts patients and their support systems as well. Losing toes, feet, and legs, and all the associated pain and suffering is the most undignified way to eventually leave this life. The Save a Leg, Save a Life Foundation has made it part of our mission to change all this. The great news is that technology and preventative measures exist. That can make a significant impact on reducing the number of amputations, especially among high-risk groups. During the month of September, we encourage you to join us in a fun way to call attention to this disease that is preventable and treatable. We ask that you, your friends, colleagues, pets, or any other animate or inanimate object, wear a single white sock either over a pants leg or otherwise visible and to have photos taken and then post it on social media sites. You can post photos on our Facebook site, the Save a Leg, Save a Life Foundation, go on a Twitter or use the hashtag Docs in Socks. That's D-O-C-S-I-N-S-O-C-K-S. -S. Our goals are several. Through this effort that we envision going viral, we will increase awareness about peripheral arterial disease, educate, and assist those in need through our philanthropic efforts. The majority of funds we raise will be used to assist those with financial hardship to have greater access to preventative care by purchasing and distributing items such as diabetic socks, shoes, wound care supplies, knee walkers, and to receive screenings for peripheral arterial disease. Screening for PAD is simple, and the first steps are a few simple questions to answer in an examination of the feet. So many lower extremity amputations are preventable, and by taking a proactive approach to this deadly disease, we will save many legs as well as lives. The good news about PAD is that it's highly preventable, and through lifestyle changes and better management of certain conditions, we can really make an impact. Also, there are technologies that are grossly underutilized. We believe that if the public has a better understanding of what PAD is, we can really start to make the change that we need to. So again, I hope you'll join us during the month of September with our White Sock campaign. Again, go to Docs and Socks, or again, thesalsal.org. That's www. T-H-E-S-A-L-S-A-L dot -S org. And I hope to see you on our Facebook site soon. Thank you very much. Wow, that was a really, really good video. So if you did not hear it or you did not get to see all of the video, I invite you to go to um, YouTube or you can go to the Sal Sal website and you can actually watch it there again. I think it's worth a second glance myself. So it's time now for us to get into the meat of the matter. Tonight, our guest speaker is no stranger to most of us. Dr. Delton Livingston Farkinson is our guest speaker. He has an extensive CV, so you know I can't read all of that tonight. He is a true son of the soil. He was born to parents from Acklands, and he grew up here in New Providence. He attended the Ridgeland Primary School, and he actually went on to UWI, and his first healthcare job was actually as a pharmacist. He went to medical school to UWI in Trinidad, and did surgical residency at Dalhousie University in Canada. His vascular surgery training was done at Kansas University. Dr. Farkinson is a highly trained and compassionate physician. He loves his work and has many, many hours of continuing education from regularly attending conferences. He has done a lot of research in this area as well, 
and is actively involved in training our young doctors to make sure that they can also do the work that he's doing. If you know Dr. Farkasin at all, I know you know his favorite hobby is fishing, fishing and more fishing. He's married to his wife Bernadette and they for more than two decades and they have one adult child. Help me welcome our speaker, Dr. Delton Farkasin. Hi, good evening, everybody. Can can everyone hear me? Good evening. Yes, we can hear you clearly. Yes. I, I, I just want to I want to thank um, Dr. Mitchell for that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, tonight is a special night, and everyone she she's made everyone aware that September is um, Vascular Disease Month, and we're happy to be participating and this awareness program, along with the Sal Sal Foundation. Vascular disease is, is, affects everybody. And if you think about it, outside of lung cancer and pancreatic cancer, it, is, it, it, it wrecks havoc on our societies around the world. So tonight we're gonna to talk about flow to the toe. And I hope at the end of this presentation, Um, that, that all of us will benefit. I have no disclosures, no monetary disclosures to gain or nothing, and this is all for information. So we're gonna be talking about the blood flow to the foot. We can discuss the concept of critical limb ischemia and critical limb threatening ischemia and the nuances of both. We'll discuss the reasons for interruption of blood flow to the toe the concept of angiosomes and the relationship to foot ulcers. And then we'll just briefly mention some of the treatment methods that we use to restore flow to the toe. So the foot has th three main blood vessels supplying it. Two of those, if you, if you start at the knee and go down to the ankle, there are three blood vessels. But when you reach the ankle, there's only two. There's one on the outside, I'll, I'll describe it in simple terms so you can understand it. There's one on the outside, there's one on the inside, and then there's one in the middle, okay? The one on the outside and the one on the inside continues past the ankle, and the one that's in the middle stops at the ankle. So we're gonna talk about the foot now. The foot is what's below the ankle. So at the ankle, the inside blood vessel comes behind the ankle and goes to supply the bottom of the foot. The outside blood vessel also goes anterior in front of the ankle and supplies the blood on top of the foot. The picture you see here now is the blood vessels from the outside and it's um, supplying blood to the top of the foot. And you can see that it gives blood to all the toes. This picture here shows the blood supply from the inside blood vessel that supplies the bottom of your foot. And so between these two circulation, between these two blood vessels, the entire foot is served, okay? Now, I apologize for some of the pictures that you're gonna see, but believe it or not, this is how people present and understanding how, these, how this blood flow to the foot will indicate how the circulations are affected and what people present with. So, like I say, I apologize for all these, all these feet that present like this, but this is how people present to the hospital, okay? And this indicate that most of these toes are dead or a part of the foot is dead. Anytime you see something black, it is bad, it is no good, it is dead, okay? And sometimes you don't have to present with 
They presented with the heel, okay? And more feet, unfortunately, this is what we live with every day in our society, people presenting like this. And there's not a day that passed that I don't get somebody who don't present with something like this. So what the problem is, is someone present with a, with, 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 with a toe that's black or a foot that's black, we, we, we look at this as someone who is, will eminently lose their limb. And that has a bad outcome, whether we like to say it or not. And people, it doesn't, it doesn't look good in our society. It doesn't look good in our healthcare. It doesn't look in our primary care. It doesn't look good in our communities. And, and people present like this and we have to do something about it. So here comes the concept of critical limb ischemia. So critical limb ischemia was first described in 19, 1982, and it, 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 it speaks to a limb that is threatened because of ischemia. Ischemia means that you have no blood flow or no blood bringing life to the foot. And we spoke about that earlier in the, in the devotion where blood brings life. And when you have no life going to the toe or to the foot, that, that part of the limb, uh, that part of the body dies, okay? And so back in, 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 the, in the early 80s, we classify this, we made a classification as ischemia because we wanted to know who will be able to get an amputation and who would, which part of the foot will be saved. If there's no blood flow, pa patients are painful, um, they, they get ulcers, they get so sort of things. And so we were able to identify patients based on the degree of ischemia or the degree of, of blockages and identify those patients who limbs that we can save or who toes that we can save and who those who we cannot. And so this information was based on some research and it shows that if you have ankle pressure of 40 and you have pain, that would be a problem. If you have ankle pressure that's less than 60 and you have dead, dead tissue or dead toes or something, and that's a problem. And so this was one of the first ways that we learned to delineate uh, what was going on with these patients. And so this, this was a broad classification and, and it, it captured every single thing. And it was never intended for use of diabetics uh, um, at that time because patients with diabetics presented in so many different ways um, that, uh, and, and, and they had so many different types of symptoms. It was just hard to quantify them or put them in one group where they only had um, infection or one where they had this or one group where they had that. And so diabetes at that time was difficult to define, but it, it still was thrown in in this hodgepodge of things and we couldn't measure things, okay? So there were, because of these two broad applications, we couldn't identify the natural history of PAD or the concept of critical limb ischemia. And, and, we, and, and, and we couldn't classify this um, uh, um, to identify who is more at risk to, to lose the limb and who can just benefit from giving some medication, okay? During this time, there was a, constant and dramatic increase in the occurrence of diabetes. And limb threatening became a part of this broad spectrum of diseases. And the outcome of limb, of limb ischemia was determined by how much blood was flowing to the foot, how much tissue was dead, and how bad the infection was, okay? This chart shows this chart shows what happened to the US population from 1958 to 2015. And you could see that the number of patients with diabetes increased every year, except one, that's around 1996, 1997. Every year, there was an increase in the amount of patients who had diabetes and the percentage of people who had diabetes. And diabetes has been, it has, has been recognized as an independent risk factor for developing peripheral arterial disease. And you can see, even when you compare to the other risk factors as smoking, high blood pressure, um, high cholesterol, advancing age, high blood pressure, diabetes itself gives someone a four time higher risk of developing peripheral arterial disease than any other risk factor. And so we fast forward 40 years later, 
um, on where we learn a little bit, where we start to, to dwell deeply into, in, into diabetes and the effects on the circulation. Now we recognize that the impact of diabetes on peripheral arterial disease and the term critical limb threatening ischemia became more a part of our nomenclature because now we can quantify and we can measure diabetes and in relation to PAD. So critical limb ischemia became a new paradigm for the treatment and research of peripheral arterial disease. And a practice guideline was created just just so we can actually look at this. And this encompasses the name, the, how we could the stage disease. We have evidence based or research evidence um, that will allow for future evolution um, and improvement in PAD and in vascular surgery. And this made consistent, um, ma ma made us be able to consistently assess patient wherever you go. So if I use this, this nomenclature in the Bahamas, it will, it will hold true for the patients in Turks and Caicos or hold true for the patients in England or in the United States. And so hence the, the new paradigm. And, and what the new paradigm did, it was it, it, br it brought together a classification system that look at all the different parts of diabetes and stage it in such a way so that we can actually see what's happening. And, and, and later on, I'll, I'll, I'll show you how complex this problem is, is diabetes and peripheral arterial disease. But, 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 but the limb threat and the complexity of diabetes, when you compare to the old system, the old system is Rutherford and the new system is Wi-Fi, you can see we account for ischemic rest pain, for ulcers, for gangrene, for ischemia and infection all. And then we can actually measure the system and be consistent with that measurement. Go and sit down. Now, how do, how, how, what affects blood flow to the foot? The one thing that is common in diabetes is atherosclerosis. And the one thing I want people to understand is atherosclerosis do not start when you get 50. It starts when you are a child and it depends on what we put into our mouth and what we eat. The quality and the quantity of food that we eat for that we are fed from a child all the way up until we are adults. And this is a slow process that starts with simple fatty streaks and progress to something really bad. Uh, this is an ugly side and it's confusing, but just imagine how a, a, a atherosclerotic a plaque looks under a microscope and you see so much things going on here. You see the yellow little balls of cholesterol and you see um, the blue things are foam cells, which are inflammatory cells. And you see um, the red blood cells forming a clot. So all of these things work together to cause a uh, milieu that causes injury to the blood vessel. Diabetes itself accelerates this process, okay? So if you take a patient at 50 who have diabetes, their, their blood vessels is equivalent to someone that is 60 who don't have diabetes. So diabetes itself as a disease accelerates the formation of atherosclerosis. And atherosclerosis is the underlying cause for most of the problems we see in peripheral arterial disease. Patients with diabetes have a complex problem, have a complex patho pathophysiology. It involves losing sensory nerve, losing the ability to move and the mechanics of their foot, losing um, the ability to keep the skin moist or the autonomic neuropathy. And they, on top of that, they develop vasculopathy because of all this accelerated atherosclerosis. And then when, you, when your sugar is very high, you become immune deficient. The immune system becomes dysfunctional and you can't do, it can't do what it's supposed to do. So when you combine all of these things together, you end up with a bad 
ischemia, you end up with infection, and you end up with breakdown in the skin that eventually leads to diabetes. Here is it in another form, high glucose level. It provides a, in a, a milieu for bacteria to develop, and this leads to infection. You get a neuropathy or Law, you lose sensation in your feet. You, you don't. You can't sense when you get injured or you get stick or you have something in your shoe. You develop an ulcer. This ulcer is open to the dirt and the and the bacteria. And again, that con contributes to infection. You have, and and so this complex, um, this this complex um, milieu in the diabetic foot always leads to ischemia. When you look at the natural history of critical limb ischemia and you look at the, the outcome, in one year, there are only about 45% of the patients with critical limb ischemia are alive with, two, with both of their limbs intact. About 30% of these patients already had an amputation and about 25% go on to glory, okay? Out of the patients that are alive, the 45%, 20% of them continue to go downhill with respect to having ischemia and only 25% of these patients resolve. And so this in itself makes diabetes and peripheral arterial disease a bad outcome at the end of the day. And when we look at, when we look at, all, at what happens in the limb, and we can see that patients who have disease in the groin, between the groin and the knee, we can see that about 25% of the arteries are blocked, okay? In, 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 uh, um, in about 73% of the cases, they have blood clots, and then another 2% is totally blocked, that they can't even get no blood flow, okay? Uh, and, and so you see a combination of atherosclerosis, with narrowing of, blood, uh, of the blood vessels and the development of, of blood clot causing a lot of problems. When you go between the knee and the ankle, this changes quite a bit. About 33% of the patients have atherosclerosis and associated blood clot and the remaining 67% have total occlusion. The vessels just don't work and they're completely blocked and blood cannot flow to the foot or to the toe. So when we look at critical limb ischemia and we have to treat this problem, we have to look at it in, in a broad sense. We look at it of, at the limbs that we can save and the limbs that we cannot save. And the limbs that, that we cannot save, um, we, we, have to, we have to make a choice. We want these patients to live and we have to do an amputation, or if they don't want to live, or if they don't want no amputation, they end up dying. Unfortunately, some people opt for that option. So out of the limbs that we can save, we look ahead and we go ahead and we do the proper investigation, and then we use different surgical techniques to get these patients to heal, to get the ulcers to heal, to get them walking again, all right? One thing that is short in our country is that a lot of people are afraid of amputation, but if you think about the images that I show you before, and when there's nothing else to be done and amputation is the only resort, that sometimes is the best option for many people. What we don't have is a good rehab program to get these people mobilized, to get them getting prosthesis and getting them moving again. Now, in relationship to blood flow, now, the concept of angiosomes come in. The, the uh, angiosome is a unit of tissue that is supplied by a specific artery and drained by a specific vein. And when we, when what we have learned over the time, if we can revascularize specific arteries, um, then we should have better outcomes in terms of wound healing and limb salvage. Okay. Of, of, there are 40 angiosomes in the body and the foot alone has six of those. Okay, if you remember the blood vessel that goes on the inside, that blood vessels supply three main areas of the foot. The one that's on the outside only supply one area of the foot and the one that stops at the ankle supplies two areas of the foot. You're gonna see this, this diagram and you'll understand it. So the first diagram, the first picture with the anterior tibia on, on my left and your right, also on my left, 
the, the one in the purple, the anterior tibial artery, okay, that's applied the top of the foot. So most times if you have a problem on the top of your foot, we try to oh, keep that vessel open so that the, you will have, so that you'll, you'll, you, you can have flow to your toe. The blood vessel on the inside of the PTA or the posterior tibial artery, that supplies the bottom of the foot and the bottom of the foot is divided into three. You have the heel, you have the medial and you have the lateral, okay? The heel, the medial where, it, where the big toe is and the lateral where the small toe is. And if you have a problem in that distribution, we try and get that blood vessel open so that you can um, um, to, to, for limb salvage. And the blood vessel that stops the ankle, it supplies the back of the heel and the outside top of the foot. And we try to get that open so that um, we can help you save your limb. Now, this is a complex slide and it tells us um, what we do and how we stage people again. And, and, and staging involves looking at how much infection you have, looking at your circulation, looking at um, the function, and, and, and we do this in conjunction with wound care, all right? Like I say, sometimes we have to do amputation. And if you're a candidate for limb salvage, we take you to this risk stratification because we want you to survive. We try and address all the problems that diabetes occur, your heart, your kidney, and your limbs. And then we get you into a surgical procedure, whether we do it by minimally invasive or by open surgery. Now, limb loss is not good. And by no means am I advocating that that is the only thing that we do. Sometimes it is necessary. But when someone lose their limb, there are some effects that have to happen. There are physical effects. There is a total change in lifestyle. Patients are limited in their ability to move and, and move around. They have stump and, and phantom limb pain. They have contractures, they get tired. They get exhausted from just trying to move. There's decreased life expectancy. The load that losing a limb put on the rest of the body sometimes is too much. There's a change in family responsibility and duties. These physical changes also lead to psychological changes. And a lot of patients have become depressed. They get anxious. They get post-traumatic stress disorder. The quality of life and their loss of independence and mobility decreases. They lose self-esteem and they lose confidence. They have body image disturbances. They have adjustment disorders. Some patients can't cope. And we see an increasing amount of suicide in these group of people. So losing a limb has some downsides. Let's tell you a story. This was a 52-year-old man, a very young man. He was known to have hypertension and diabetes. Six months before I saw him, he had an injury to his toe, to four toes, and he decided that he would treat it himself. Two months into the treatment, his self-prescribed treatment, he got a second injury. So four months after that, he um, while he was while he was healing for both of these injuries that he decided to treat himself, he decided to take a bath in some hot water, and he didn't know that he burnt himself. So when he presented, he presented with pain. He presented with swelling. His foot was not in a good, it was not, not smelling really good. And he actually got put out of his house because his wife fell out. You need to go find someplace else to live. He didn't have any fever, didn't have any chills. His sugar was out of control. So I'm gonna show you a picture. He didn't have any pulses. This is what his foot looked like. Okay. So he had an infected foot. He had wet gangrene. He had an abscess in the middle of his foot. His diabetes was out of control. All right. After the first couple of weeks of treatment, this is what his foot ended up looking like. We were not finished yet because he had a problem with flow to the toe. And we did an angiogram, and I don't know if you can see this. And if you see this, only his inside vessel, his inside vessel was, was represented, but he had some problems in that inside vessel, okay? So we decided to treat him with minimally invasive check technique. 
and we were able to open up this the second photograph you can see that the inside vessel and the outside vessel as well as the vessel that stopped above the ankle we were able to get that open also the third photograph shows that his, his blood flow above his knee was was stopped so we we, we were able to Stop we, were, we were able to open up that blood vessels. And so uh, in the last photograph, you can see both the out in the outside vessel. Oh, no, Leslie, I can't answer you right now. Let's all the way down the mic. Mic. So okay. in the end, we were able to get his foot healed. And it took almost nine months to get his foot to normal. Now he is wearing shoes and he is back to work and doing his, his, his less one toe, but he still have a limb. So in summary, critical limb ischemia, critical limb threatening ischemia is uncommon, but it has a significant impact on life and life expectancy. We have come a long way in understanding the pathogenesis and pathophysiology of critical limb ischemia and critical limb threatening ischemia and the role that diabetes play in its impact and its outcomes. Treatment warrants aggressive efforts at revascularization, including surgery to risk reduce the risk of amputation. Remember that amputation has some downsides. So that's some physical and some psychological scarring that we really have, have not addressed efficiently. Endovascular options have extended our abilities to treat and care for such a patient and, and, and with this debilitating outcome. It takes a team, it takes a team. No one person can treat diabetes. And this is a small a microcosm of what it's, a, a, a team looks like, the diabetic rapid response acute foot team. Thank you. And I'll answer any questions. Awesome, awesome, Dr. Parkinson. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. And um, we are very pleased. I mean, I, I see the chat is lighting up and we're gonna get all of those questions. Um, we just wanna give everybody a chance to put their questions in the chat. And I see some hands raised already. So I'm gonna um, begin by recognizing them. The first one I see is um, Galaxy AO3 core, no name, but you can unmute yourself and um, ask your question. You have a question? Yes, I do. What about numbness in the feet? Dr. Falconer, she wants to know about numbness in the feet, if that has something to do with the um, blood flow as well. I spoke to the in terms of sensitivity. We, we call it, a, we have a different big name for numbness. But what happened is um, diabetes cause numbness in several ways. One, because you have an increased elevation of glucose in the bloodstream, the body only can tolerate a certain level of glucose at a certain particular time. So it sends the excess glucose to an alternative pathway. That alternative pathway pro produces byproducts that affects um, the nerves. And those, those byproducts usually damage the nerves. And it starts with the nerves in the feet and in the, at the tip of the feet and in the tip of the fingers. And so that, that's the first way, and we call that a diabetic peripheral neuropathy. The second way that nerves are damaged from diabetes is that because diabetes causes an acceleration of atherosclerosis or hardening of the blood vessel, the blood supply to the nerves are secondarily damaged when the blood supply to the legs are affected. And so if you have no blood flow to the legs, 
Just imagine that none, no blood flow to the tissues and nerves are a part of the tissue into the, into the, into the leg and into the foot. And if you cannot um, send those sensory signals, the nerves die if, if, the, if it doesn't get um, nutri nutrients also. So they're the two major ways in which nerves are damaged um, with diabetes. We call it all sensory neuropathy. But you also have a, a, an autonomic neuropathy um, and motor neuropathy. Thank you very much. Excellent, excellent. So we have um Garnell Kemp. You can open your mute. You can unmute your mic and ask your question, please. Good evening. Thank Good you, evening. Dr. Parkinson. Awesome presentation. Um, the question I, the concern I have is those photos that were shown, um, with all the different color of the skin, the darkness, and everything. Persons wait that long before they come to a doctor. Yeah, they actually do, yes. So those 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 are all of those pictures are actual patients that I've taken care of some as recently as Friday. Um so so they be in a lot of pain to be having their feet that long. Yes, ma'am. It's very pain. It's a very Jeez. painful, it's a very painful condition. Ooh. Okay, that's that's my concern. I, oh no, another one. Um, sometimes my father's diabetic, and sometimes he has um, like from his knee down, straight down to his foot. He said, um, be painting him, and uh, like underneath um to the toes. But he just rubbed down with alcohol or what have you, and um, then it sometimes it just disappear. Is that a concern or? Yeah, it, it is a concern. Like I said earlier, um, um, neuropathy occurs in two ways from diabetes, and he ought to be see, seeing somebody who is, is well versed in managing those things. Okay, so that would be a foot doctor, or you? <laughs> I I think if he have a a diabetic specialist, mm -hmm. he can start with that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay, our next person is Joanne Wallace. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, good evening. Excellent presentation, sir. Um, what happens or how severe is the flow of blood to that area of the feet when you find that uh, you hit something and you don't feel it? And, and sometimes um, some people have, they fall down and then they find that uh, they're driving and when they think they're pressing the brakes or whatever and it's not pressing, they end up getting in an in, in accident. How, how serious is that for attention as far as the, the body and the blood flow is concerned? Well, I think anytime you lose sensation to your feet that you can't feel it is a very important because not only can something as bad as an accident happen but you can actually have an injury that you cannot actually detect or you can't you 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 don't, don't sense and that injury has led to many of those people feet um, being the way it is um, um so if you if you feel like you um have lost sensation in your feet you need to find somebody to assess it and, uh, uh, and, and manage it pro appropriately Okay. Thank you. Amen. Okay, so our next next question comes from Lena Reyes. Yes, uh, this is not Lena Reyes, but I have a question for <laughs> okay. Dr. Parkinson. Uh, do you have any uh, alternative treatment for a diabetic uh, patient uh, 30 years uh, with, with diabetes and uh, numbness in the feet and hand, like uh, three quarter below knee, both knee, uh, uh, no no sensation, and uh, I was diagnosed also uh, in twenty sixteen with with plant plantar fasciitis, and me reading in in. In the internet, I, I also was aware that 
uh, palmal fasciitis also exists, uh, and I, I, I have the same condition in my hand that I have in the sole of my foot. Do you have any alternative treatment like uh, swimming, go to the beach, or uh, watching your diet, what you eat? But all of that at this time, I have some uh, uh, lesion in, in the sole of my foot. Do you have anything to I can guide? It can be guided. Well, a, a, a part of a part of treatment, sir, is 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 having a, a, a healthy, well balanced diet, and certainly um, your diabetologist or your diabetic specialist should be able to guide you in the appropriate treatment, whether it is a um, um, Western Westernized medicine or alternative medicine. the The objective is to maintain a normal blood sugar. If your blood sugar cannot be normalized or is not normalized, then achieving satisfactory goals will, will be a challenge. And so you have to work hand in hand with your diabetic specialist um, um, to, to, to achieve these goals. And I'm sure they can find some kind of some 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 treatment or some alternative treatment that that would help you. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much for your questions as well. We have some questions in the chat and I will just read them for you. So uh, as a diabetic, how often should one have their feet checked for blood flow? Go ahead and answer that, Dr. Mitchell. Huh? Answer that. <laughs> as a diabetic, you should have your feet checked at least once per year. And that includes for blood flow as well as for the neuropathy um, and for the functioning of the foot generally. Um, if at that time when you're screened and the foot is checked, then um, you may have to be checked more often than once per year based on your risk factors. And then sometimes we have to send you to Dr. Farkasen because when you present at that time, um, um, you already have um, PAD, severe PAD or other um, um, ischemia at that time. So at least once per year, but more often based on um, how often, based on what we see in the screening. Okay, our next question is, so you have a patient, a primary care has a patient, what is the criteria to refer the patient to see a podiatrist or a vascular surgeon like you? Why would you send to a podiatrist or send to a vascular? Say that again, sorry. What's the, what's the question? They want to know what is the criteria for them to decide whether to send a patient to see a podiatrist or to send them to see the vascular specialist. Um, a, 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 a podiatrist as well as a vascular specialist, both of them are well-versed in managing a diabetic foot. Now, if you if you think that the loss of blood flow is more urgent, then you would want to send them to the vascular surgeon, preferably before you send them to the podiatrist. If they have some other anatomical or some biomechanical or just some ulcer with blood flow, then either one will be equally as good. But the vascular specialist has to do with the eminent loss of limb. So if you feel like someone is going to lose their limb eminently, you'll want to direct them to the vascular surgeon or the vascular specialist first. If the patient already has a, a, a gangrene of their toe, you would want them to go to the vascular specialist first. If the patient have a ulcer that has been around for six months and is not getting better uh, and all that, then Either, either specialist can assess that patient and whoever um, will, will provide the better care, well, they will be referred between those two. Okay. So what if one is not a diabetic but still has severe numbness in the bottom of the feet and some itching as well? Could that be a vascular problem? Well, again, again, 
numbness in the feet, either the 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 the, the podiatrist or the vascular special can assess the patient appropriately and send them on to whoever um, it will best be able to treat that person. If the patient has neuropathy, um, certainly the podiatrist will be able to pick that up or the vascular specialist will be able to pick it up. And so there's no difference in, in that assessment for, for, for that problem. Okay, we have a question in the chat. I'm going to just answer that. It says, does diabetes cause um, peripheral, I mean, plantar fasciitis? It does not, but some diabetics can be at risk for getting plantar fasciitis because a lot of them sometimes have um, flat feet and um, changes in the shape of the feet and the functioning of the feet. So they can be at a little bit higher risk for getting um, um, plantar fasciitis. Now, I see a lot of questions here on neuropathy, which Dr. Farkasen already answered. So I'm going to um, move on to um, our patients automatically referred for psychological help after an amputation. Please remember um, to mute your mic. Mute your mic. Dr. Farkasen, you heard that one? Yes, uh, m most patients, uh, uh, th 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 there's a hodgepodge of, of a lot of it. A lot of referral surgery <laughs> is not well accepted um, in our society. And even though we make the recommendation, um, people think that it's only because we think that they're crazy, but it's not. Uh, so, so, yes, patients are referred automatically, but it's not widely accepted. The first ever royal Okay, I can answer this question too. Um, it's asking if they can um, visit, and you already answered this, either Dr. Myself or you for diabetic care. And yes, we will do the screening and can um, um, treat any condition of the foot like that. Um, I think Dr. Ferguson was very clear when he said that, you know, whenever you have imminent blood loss or, or um, imminent loss of limb or quick possible loss of limb amputation at risk for amputation then they should see the vascular surgeon urgently so that is that is answered that question as well um can someone with peripheral neuropathy be at risk for decreased circulation in the feet i think you covered that one already numbness in the toes okay all right i think we covered all of the questions from the chat um so, we want to thank you, Dr. Farkasen. In the chat, you may see there are many, many um, 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 accolades. Awesome job. Thank you so much. Oh, I see a hand raised. I'm going to get them in a minute. Awesome job. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Wonderful information. So, thank you so much. You can see the um, um, persons really appreciate understanding exactly what's going on with um, the blood flow to the toe. Um, I have one other question here and somebody has a raised, two persons have a raised hand. Uh, one, one applause and one raised hand. I can't see the name. So the person who has their hands raised, can you just ask your question, please? Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Um, um, who are the podiatrists? Do you recommend? Um, can you name a podiatrist? I'm going to recommend myself, Dr. Monique Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. If you put your email in the chat, I will um, um, give you a contact number. <laughs> I have to call you because I'm one of these um, old persons. Who, <laughs> who, who I get, I'll who give you a number then. The internet like I should. All right, no problem. I'll give you a number, 802-3668. You can call me on that. Okay, Dr. Farkasen, more. Excellent presentation. Thank you, Dr. Farkasen. Um, we have one more question. Is this, is this still you or that somebody else? I guess that was her. She didn't lower her hand. Okay, that's Ms. Wallace. Yes, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Um, based based on the seminar and all the information given given a few um few minutes ago, um, 
diabetes seems to be the number one underlining condition which promotes these other the amputation and, and, and blood flow to the body to the body and causes amputation. If an individual gets sorry, 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 Miss Wallace. Can you mute your mute your mic, please? Just that. I'm not sure who that is. Can you mute your mic, please? To the last, despite her mobility issues, perhaps Prince Charles could have asked on the night of his mother's birthday. Galaxy and Clara Maxi. Galaxy. Thank you. And Clara Maxi, those mics are open. Okay. Thank you very much. I couldn't see them. Go ahead, Miss Wallace. Continue. Okay. So um, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So if the diabetes is is under control, because obviously other conditions are waiting in, in, in the wind to wreak havoc on the body. Once the diabetes is in control, your, 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 your nutrition is checked, you're eating properly, um, that condition, would, would it go away completely? Or you'll still have to have treatment, treatment based on, I guess, your age of being the factor or whatever. The, the issue, ma'am, is that um, once you once 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 you uh, have a have a complications of diabetes, it doesn't go away. Okay. So you still have to manage the complication that you have. So, so eating, uh, eating correctly, all those, all you're doing is maintaining uh, a, a homeostatic state, but it doesn't cause the condition to go away just because at that point in time, the damage has already been done. So the damage doesn't go away. You don't get a new leg or a new toe or anything to start with. Okay. You understand that? Yes, sir. Okay, so, so it doesn't go anywhere. Your your, your injury or your, the the effect of the diabetes has already taken its toll. Right. So you have to manage whatever is left behind. Okay, so on the onset, someone was who was just feeling the numbness, and 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 they found out okay maybe um that condition. Then you once you check with the doctor, that can be corrected. Is that correct? Well, the, 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 the um, diabetic neuropathy has been shown over time to be reversible in some cases, but it, there is a point in time in which it's still irreversible. So you have until you get to that point, you may come to that point and don't know. And um, remember, a lot of patients have diabetes for 10, 15 years before they actually may have a, a formal diagnosis of diabetes. Yes. And yes, so the injury, the injury is happening for 10 or 15 years before you get a diagnosis. And so yes. by the time you get a diagnosis, you are well on the way to having the effects of the diabetes. And so when you, even when you get the diabetes and you change your, your eating habit and your exercise program and all that, and everything becomes well, you had 10 or 15 years of problems and that wouldn't go away. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Why I uh, um, put the, question to you. I have a, a brother, my older brother and my nephew, both of them. Well, the older brother has only three toes on one feet and three toes on the other feet. So he has to wear the shoes and for balance. And then my nephew, he came down from Andros. Um, he's very young. He's only 50, but he knew that he had diabetes for about 15 years. So when his body started to wreak havoc, he came down and was, he's a body man and he was doing some work and he can see. And then for about two weeks and then one morning he wake up and he couldn't see anything at all. And at the same time, he was down here from Andrews because I found that most persons on the other island don't have that regular care and um, clinic and all the things really get bad with them. And he was treating an abscess in his foot. There was a hole in his foot that wasn't getting better. And then he got treated now, but he ended up during that process um, become, becoming blind, uh, diabetes blindness. So that's why I'm asking if 
if initially you just feel the numb and, and every it's not hurting or whatever, and you happen to have, see like a, a, a black, I don't know when one of the toes go black, is that's the beginning stage for immediate check, you know, because I have experience in my family where there's amputation and when the, where there's ongoing treatment. A black toe is dead. Athlete, a black toe. A black toe is dead. It's too late. So what you what we what we attempt to do is save the rest. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, ma'am. Because you could be living and things could be going on with you, and you don't have an understanding, and if you don't know who to ask, who to have a conversation with. That's most of the times why it gets to the severe severity and then it, when it's too late. But if you have that conversation prior to, just like how they promote the cancer, you know, where you go and get your mom, because people are terrified of doing these things, of hearing the wrong things. But sometimes if you're proactive, you can save yourself and, you know, save your life. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Farkasen, for that very informative um, presentation. Um, I, uh, I was concerned about the pictures, but most persons received them well, and they were they were they recognized that that's a major major problem. And um, so, thank you for also answering all those questions. And you can tell from the chat, everybody was very appreciative of the information and everything that you presented to our guest. This evening would not have been a success without you. We could not have done this with you. So we want to say thank you very much for coming. Our next Feed for Life presentation will be on the 13th of October. And you are invited to be there with us. We are still having persons um, um, admitting, wanting to be admitted even at this time. So we're hoping that we will see you there. For those persons who put their emails in the chat, we will definitely send you a copy of this recording. And in the next couple of days, in a week or so, we'll be able to send that to you. If there are no other questions or any other comments in the at this time, we are going to have our closing prayer by Elder Audley Mitchell. Good evening, everybody. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to learn. You've said some time ago in the scripture, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Dr. Farquharson has armed us with some additional information that is so relevant to our lives. We ask you to help us to expand that information in our own lives, that we may be more healthy. We could present our bodies to you as a living sacrifice. Help us to help those around us. Help us to be helpers to others as well. We ask you to keep us this night. In the name of Jesus and for his sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much everyone for coming. Um, as you can see on this slide that's um, showing now, um, you can see the contact information for our office, Bahama Surgical. So if you have a concern about peripheral arterial disease, you want to just get checked to make sure that your blood is flowing to the feet. Um, you can just contact us at 603-1814-15 or 16. So you can um, just come on in and we'll be able to let you know exactly what's going on down there. Thank you so much and have a wonderful night. And you we'll see you again. again please? Oh, 603. Aren't you seeing it? Sorry. 603-1814. Or one five one eight one four one eight one five one eight one six. So that's eighteen, fourteen, fifteen, or sixteen. So any one of those you can call. Just make an appointment, and we would be able to um 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 get you in and check your blood flow for you. So thank you again for coming, and we are very pleased that you were here, and we hope that the information that you got help you and help somebody else as well. So please share it. Thank you very much and good night. Good night, buddy. Good night. Thank you, Doc. We'll see you later.